All right, welcome everyone to week 19 of Native Strong Town Hall on the COVID-19 response with Dr. Lyle Ignace from the Gerald L. Ignace Indian Health Center. We are coming to you from Zoom today, um, some technical difficulties, so we're not Facebook Live, but we will post that, uh, we'll be posting that via our YouTube channel uh, later today after our completion. So apologies there, um, you know, technical difficulties, live with them, live without them. Um, but so if you are here with us on Zoom, you can jump in and add a question via the chat, bob, chat bubble, excuse me, which will be at the top or bottom of your interface or your screen. Um, just drop a comment in there uh, if you have any questions as we go along and then we will kind of moderate those at the end in a Q&A session. And uh, as we usually do, we try to get to as many as we can. Um, but uh, again, a welcome back. And if you're joining us for the first time or a return visitor, um, we appreciate you being here. And with that, I will uh, pass this along to our moderator, Mark Denning. Thanks again, Mark, for being with us. Hello, everybody. And to those who that are watching uh, via Facebook, uh, many apologies. Uh, we could not do this live uh, because of technical reasons, uh, so we're sorry. But to those of you that are on Zoom, this is live. Uh, so you know, that means that your chat box works. Uh, those of you familiar with the format will uh, see in the bar either to the side or lower part of your screen, sometimes upper. I believe there's a chat uh, sort of prompt there and if you take your cursor and go down to that area that will allow you to get us notes uh, so again uh, if you have any questions maybe you want to represent questions of, from someone you had a discussion with this past week please ask those questions there and get them out as soon as you can uh, this isn't one of those places where we just wait for the presentation then ask uh, we're looking for those questions right away as they occur to you we do have a pretty good presentation, and there's the reason and philosophy behind it. Uh, and we just got through with one of our busiest weekends in Indian country uh, to travel, and that is Labor Day weekend. Uh, usually on Labor Day, a lot of us are going home. We're going to different states. We're going to different areas, different cities, or people are coming into the Milwaukee area from different places. That's just not happening for us. That's for other people as well. If you're watching the show, I'm sure that you may be familiar with the precautions we need to take when we're in unfamiliar circumstances, even with familiar people. But that's why we're here, talking about this on that program. Uh, so while we may not see the results, uh, will not see the results of uh, that visiting for one to two weeks, we need to be aware that there will be effects and those effects are happening all around us. And that's why we're here. So welcome everybody here to talk about COVID-19 and native to native conversations. And we're so grateful you're here. So in this small Zoom room that we have right now, please feel free once again to ask those questions. And we're gonna turn this format over to Dr. Ignace, where he kind of takes that larger picture and brings that down to a, a neighborhood, almost even to a house to house example, person to person by the end of the program on COVID-19 and what's happening in our country, <clears throat> in our state and in our home. So with that, Dr. Ignace, gonna turn this over to you. And once again, everybody welcome. And please ask those questions as you can. Dr. Ignace. Thank you, Mark. And, and thank you, Jeremiah. Um, a lot of stuff has been going on, lots of new stuff. Some things seem to be changing almost by the minute. And so this is week 19. We thought we'd change it up a bit. So instead of giving you all the uh, headline stuff last, we decided uh, let's try it first and uh, mix it up a little bit to see how this goes. So. A lot of people have been hearing about vaccines in the news lately. Um, if people remember, uh, this current administration developed a, a project effort uh, called Operation Warp Speed. And this was the collaboration of 
the CDC, FDA, NIH, uh, National Institute of Allergy and Immunology or Infectious Disease and Allergies. Um, so, and the Department of Defense, together they have been engaging uh, the private sector uh, to develop a vaccine. And this has been going on probably about five, about six, five months now. And <clears throat> so just so everybody is kind of up to date, there are nine biotech companies right now. One of, the, one of those nine are actually private. So I'm only gonna engage the eight. Um, and of these eight, six, uh, the United States actually has an active an agreement uh, with. So uh, the intention, uh, obviously, with the COVID-19 uh, virus is obviously to develop a vaccine so we can get through this um, through this effort and, 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 with, and be free of the contagion aspect of this virus, which seems to be hitting every community in the world. So just, just to go through um, the biotech companies. So right now, um, there are, are these six that are probably the most prominent, maybe the, the fourth grouping uh, is also prominent, but how they set this up is actually pretty interesting. So just, you get, everyone's going to get a, a quick uh, immunology and, and biochemistry and a uh, medical lecture up front here. So just so you know, there are four types of vaccines uh, platforms currently out there right now. The first is a, is a messenger RNA vaccine. The second is a replication defective live vector um, uh, vaccine. A third is a recombinant subunit adjuvant protein platform. And the last being the attenuated replicating live vector platform. So these are all have different processes of, of how a virus for an, uh, a vaccine is developed. There's different ways to how, the, how it's presented in a vaccine uh, for the body to develop an immune response. So, but what's, is, <clears throat> what's interesting is uh, the four uh, platforms I talked about in developing a vaccine, the US has engaged in companies, uh, private companies to uh, specifically address each, each one of these platforms. So. Um, the company of Moderna and Pfizer, in collaboration with uh, BioNTech, they've developed um, a mRNA uh, vaccine. AstraZeneca and Janssen, they are developing a replication defective live vector. Uh, Novavax, uh, Sanofi, and, and um, um, GSK, they're looking at a recombinant adjuvant protein and so each one of these companies are addressing all different platforms. It really is diversifying your pro portfolio, so to speak, um, because one platform may not be as good or as effective as the other. And so uh, it's better, it's best not to put all your eggs in one basket. So that's why um, when, we, when, when you hear about biotech companies and the vaccines that they're developing, you have to have an understanding of what specific platform that they're trying to uh, um, to develop. So, so when we talk about uh, the mRNA, Moderna, and Pfizer, you're probably hearing a lot about Pfizer right now. Um, so, an mRNA vaccine. So, this is a relatively new process, a new technology. So, the the information that is carried by a molecule uh, instructs the body cells to make copies of this protein of the virus. And so this MRI, this process of developing this protein is the basis for our body to respond to and attack and develop a, an immune response. So, um, so that's the, the MRI, the defective live vector 
uh, that's AstraZeneca and Janssen. So this is actually taking the, the coronavirus and specifically rendering parts of the genome, the whole genetic code of the virus, uh, parts of it to be very defective. That way it can't replicate. So even though it may be introduced as a vaccine, it, it's rendered inactive um, or I guess defective in its ability to actually cause an infection and it just presents itself and um, the body will identify it and develop an immune response. So uh, examples of this would be the, the common measles, rubella, the chicken pox, the hepatitis A. Uh, we've all heard about these vaccines. Some of us have actually gotten these. Uh, so that's what the, the virus is. So, and then when we talk about recombinant subunit adjuvant protein, this, um, instead of the entire pathogen, in this case, the virus, only subunit, uh, subunit or parts of the vaccines include only the components that best stimulate the immune system. So, um, so it introduces the, the vaccine, but only parts of the vaccine that have been known to, to be able to mount a response. So different processes and different parts of, of a virus that are, that are generated. Um, an example of this one would be the Zoster uh, vaccine or the Syndrix, uh, also the flu vaccine. So again, so we have all these companies, they're all developing different platforms of different virus uh, possibilities. And so uh, you've heard about Moderna, Pfizer, AstraZeneca got a huge amount of headline news in the past um, uh, 48 hours. And I'll kind of, I'll go through that and what's, what's going on there. So, but this is really just to introduce <clears throat> vaccines, who's making them, and the type of vaccines that are actually being created. Uh, I want to shift gears a little bit, and this is another, it's not a vaccine, but it's a good, um, it has promise, uh, and it's called nanobodies. Um, it's, a, it's a technology that's being developed and it's really the, it's a, synth a synthetic antibody. So this goes back to biochemistry. So when you're looking at this slide here, um, there is a group out of the UC uh, San Francisco who have come up and devised a nasal spray to administer synthetic antibodies, which they believe uh, will stop the spread of the coronavirus. So when you look at this slide, you look on the left side, the far left side where it says conventional antibody. So this would be kind of your typical antibody. Um, think of it like a, uh, just kind of a claw snapper, that top part. So not, I'm trying to keep this very basic, but you kind of see these two parallel, um, two parallel into a, a Y. So you, the, each antibody in our system carries a heavy chain, light chain, they come together. And those top segments that in the blue, um, these are uh, called heavy chains. And this is where the, the antigen or the virus, um, this is the antibody, the virus, the antibody part, the VH part, actually attaches to this, uh, uh, the, to the virus or to the pathogen, and it doesn't let go. This antibody then finds the, the, the our own, within our own system, it, it's uh, our own immune system, identify our antibodies, and then grab onto the antibody, and that stimulates a whole process for destruction and then ultimately um, uh, developing a, 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 uh, a response, um, immune response. 
And so that's the left side. When we start going to this heavy chain antibody, now what UC San Francisco has done is they've um, synthetically manufactured this VHH, that top blue part that actually will attach to the coronavirus. Now this, this is just an illustration, but it's very, this is the, this, the synthetic antibody generation, that segment, that heavy chain segment was specifically designed to identify coronavirus uh, itself and be able to attach. Now the good thing about this is that once it attaches to the virus, it renders it, it essentially inactive because the body will now see this, um, um, this synthetic antibody and will destroy it once it comes in contact with our own immune cells, our own fighting immune, immune uh, cells. So now this is really in research and development and, and it, it isn't for mass distribution, but it's, it's kind of interesting how this has come out. <clears throat> and you may hear more about this uh, as the weeks go by, but it can be aerosolized into this product, um, either as a nebulizer or as a nasal spray. And so with the use of it every day, it actually can prevent the virus from getting into, into our systems. So it could be a good preventative um, um, medication. That's what it's being touted as. <clears throat> and, and it could, could allow us a good bridge between where we are now to uh, when a vaccine actually becomes available. So they've done studies, they've, they've you know, um, in animals, and they found this to be actually quite effective, um, both in the nebulizer aerosolized into the lungs, as well as into the nose spray. Um, they're claiming almost 100% <clears throat> capture and destruction uh, of, of the virus. And so this certainly sounds pretty promising and, may, you know, may be something that would be worth looking into, not just in the short term, but I think in the long term as well. So nanobody, so it's not a specific, you know, company or anything like that. It is the, the technology, um, uh, and there may be several different uh, research or, or companies or even universities that may be looking at this. So this is not, this is, uh, this has not gone through any clinical trials. Uh, it's only been in research and development. So it has proven or at least shown to be effective, but it has not gone through any type of uh, clinical trials like what our current vaccines are going through. So, but I wanted to introduce that because it is, um, it, it is something new that is out there and you and we'll probably be hearing a lot more about this therapeutic. Um, the only problem is it may take a while for it to actually reach the street. So, um, but you've now you've heard about it and you can certainly tell your friends what it is. Now, <clears throat> AstraZeneca is in the news because they had made an announcement that they were going to uh, stop or put a halt to their uh, phase three clinical trial. Um, now, <clears throat> just so everyone knows, AstraZeneca was one of the first biotech companies there with the University of Oxford and uh, the UK and the United States had a, uh, a very early agreement uh, about the the development and the distribution of of this vaccine. So, uh, AstraZeneca was one of those companies first on the scenes on developing this. However, what has come out in the last forty eight hours is that uh, AstraZeneca had to put a halt to its trial because one of their volunteer uh, subjects uh, got sick and what they call an adverse event. 
an adverse event. So uh, it was a lot of quietness talk about it, but uh, ultimately kind of more of the details are coming out now. So when, when AstraZeneca went into its uh, clinical phase three trials, they didn't just do UK, they did uh, other parts uh, as well as the United States. And so all over the world, there are places that AstraZeneca is doing their, their vaccine trials. This particular person is a female and out of the UK and um, has been confirmed that this individual did receive the COVID-19, did not receive the placebo uh, um, uh, vaccine, but did receive their, their vaccine. And um, it has come out that she has a preliminary diagnosis of transverse myelitis. And is actually has improved and, and, and has been discharged uh, from the hospital to, to go home. Now, what also hasn't been talked about is this, is this, this isn't the first time AstraZeneca has, has a halt on its, um, uh, on its vaccine trials. This is the second time. What ha there was a, um, it was a halt back in July. And no one heard about this because this was diagnosed and at least investigated, diagnosed, and the, and the halt was lifted and it resumed. But another person had developed some neurologic problems. And in their investigation, in the, the care of this individual, it was actually found out that this person had a newly diagnosed um, um, neurologic condition called uh, multiple sclerosis or MS. Now, that's important because as we go through this transverse myelitis, I'm going to explain um, what that is and, and what's going on. So now, I have a, a picture that's up, and this is the spine. So you have, we'll go from back, back to front. So you have your spine, you have your vertebrae, and between your vertebrae, you have your spinal cord right down the middle. So you see a yellow, then a red, and a yellow, that's your spinal cord. Now, the spinal cord has its fibers and its neural connections that distribute uh, from your brain uh, out to your extremities, to your body, and to your legs, arms, and so forth. Now, Transverse myelitis is a result of the of an inflammation uh, in that can be certainly significant enough to cause injury or damage at a level of the spinal cord. So it's the what they call the myelin. The myelin is a protective sheath that protects um, uh, the spinal cord, and when that gets inflamed, uh, it actually can uh, press and cause a local issue, a local um, inflammatory reaction, whether that's a, a pure outright infection itself or as a result of recovery and inflammation and swelling at that particular spot. Now, it doesn't have to be in the lower back, it could be in the midsection, could be in the chest, could be in the neck, it could be anywhere uh, along the spinal cord. And so that's uh, it's important that when we, when, when, um, um, that if this diagnosis was to be made, that, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a textbook description. It could it occur anywhere along the spinal cord. So what is it and what's, what's so significant about this? Well, if people were to get transverse myelitis, it's usually from an infection. Uh, as the primary source, and it usually occurs maybe several hours. You know, you develop a fever, and then within a couple hours, or even a few days from that onset, um, people can start developing very unusual symptoms. And the first symptom that does come up is pain, and pain can be localized, and it's usually sharp, localized pain. Now, the problem uh, is that the pain may not just be in that one location. It actually may start going down the lower part of your back. 
uh, down your legs and or around your chest or even in your arms. And it's usually sudden in an onset. So it's not a gradual progression. It is a fairly progressive uh, acute symptom within hours or maybe even a day. Now, the problem that comes up is that it can cause nerve injury. Uh, it can cause numbness, can cause tingling, um, kind of a burning sensation sometimes, and kind of what they call a neuropathic uh, or neuropathy sens sensation. And the problem that can occur is if it can hurt, if it, if it occurs in the neck, it can cause injury to arms and everything below the level of that spinal cord. If it's in the abdomen, abdomen where it is, below, lower back to your legs. And so the higher up the lesion or the inflammation, the more risk people can actually uh, uh, develop even more significant or, or paralysis. So it can progress beyond just a local infection into a deeper infection. And if it involves more of the spinal cord, it can actually cause weakness and ultimately paralysis. So that's um, uh, transverse myelitis. Now, what we know uh, as a cause is mainly as a, as a primary infection. So this is an infectious disease problem there are other causes, but uh, I'll get into, but th the, the primary infections tend to be a virus uh, or a bacterium. So from this list, I, I was able to provide, we have the, um, the herpes virus, the ones that cause uh, chicken pox, um, that cause zoster, CMV virus, Epstein virus, HIV, West Nile, Zika, Influenza, hepatitis B, measles, mumps, rubella. So these are all pretty common viruses. And um, we see this in the general public even before COVID. Now, I have not heard of transverse myelitis in a COVID-19 patient. That's not to say that it that hasn't occurred. I'm sure it has. So but the, the number or the, the, the diversity of the, of the cause here in a virus can be pretty significant. And so um, now some of these viruses can just cause, you know, the chicken pox with the skin, they can cause respiratory symptoms, they can cause GI problems. And so, you know, we all get, you know, upper respiratory infections and coughs and colds and and, you know, when people have GI problems, they say, well, I got the flu. Well, most of us overcome it, no problems. The vast majority, this is a really a non-issue. It's only when you have that, those, those symptoms, plus the acute onset of all the other symptoms, where you really become concerned about, uh, could this be some neurologic issue like transverse myelitis? The other issue that comes up is there's bacteria causes. Lyme disease, syphilis, TB, pertussis, tetanus, diphtheria. So again, not just viruses, it can also be from, uh, from a bacterial cause as well. So now I'm gonna, the infectious parts from virus and, and bacteria tend to be the predominant uh, as far as causes. But there are other causes as well for transverse myelitis, or at least symptoms that look like transverse myelitis, and that's MS. So you can understand uh, why AstraZeneca put a halt the first time back in July, is that someone who happened to get the, uh, the vaccine experienced neurologic problems, symptoms, and then ultimately was diagnosed with an underlying problem of MS without even knowing they had it. And, and so MS can certainly mimic uh, transverse myelitis. And so that's why you have to evaluate and, and, and determine, is this truly from an infectious process or did they have a pre, uh, precondition, pre uh, unknown condition such as MS? So, uh, neuromyelitis optica 
uh, is a condition also involving the optic nerve, the myelin of the opt optic nerve. Now, everyone has to realize that the spinal cord, brain, stem, brain, optic nerve to and for sight, they're all connected. So anything that can occur along the spinal cord or a nervous system can have an inflammation. Now, uh, it can occur just by having this, this neuromyelitis, or you can have this and transverse myelitis concurrent. You can have one or the both, one or both at the same time. Sometimes it's just isolated to the optic nerve, and, and that is could be from a virus, <clears throat> or it could be from bacteria, or could it be from MS? Again, another symptom that you have to look for. Autoimmune disorders can certainly occur uh, as an underlying condition, um, and that can mimic. We have Sjogren's, uh, sometimes lupus can be part of this. So again, it, confusion, confusion, and a confusing picture because um, there are other conditions that can cause this. I'm going to skip to the bottom, another condition called sarcoidosis. This is a, an inflammatory process, and it can include the spinal cord and optic nerve. So again, we have a, another uh, another disorder that can mimic transverse myelitis. So now the other thing is vaccines um, have been associated as a possible trigger. Um, however, uh, there, there doesn't seem to be a strong correlation between vaccines and transverse myelitis. So what I'm suggesting is that there there tends to be other initiating um, conditions or in an active infectious process that is congruent or simultaneous with the vaccine so it can it can fool people so it certainly is possible that it can trigger this but it also could um, 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 be from other causes and so that's why Tests are done, MRIs are done, spinal cords, blood tests, you know, spinal taps, blood fluids. I mean, infectious disease, all these underlying blood tests that need to check for all of these bacteria causes, all of these viral causes, signs and symptoms before that, and you really follow. Now, the upside to this is that it's actually rare. This is rare. It does not occur very often. So we have to think about, you know, when it comes to vaccines, um, kids, adults, we all get vaccines. I've gotten many of vaccines. Um, and so it's important to realize that uh, as many vaccines as we give out, uh, this is still a rare occurrence. It hasn't been a cause and effect saying vaccines cause this. There's been associations and possible triggers, but no confirmation. So, um, so that is a crash course in biochemistry, uh, medical, anatomy, infectious disease, all within a few minutes. And so uh, it's important to, to know that, you know, there's gonna be an independent, independent uh, investigation on this individual, this, uh, this uh, one individual that has this diagnosis, at least a preliminary diagnosis. And this is actually a good thing. You want checks and balances when it comes to this type of vaccine because you want to assure that there is a safe and, uh, and uh, a safety profile uh, and that there are no adverse effects that will occur. Uh, and so we're going to have to wait. This is, um, this is what's actively going on. So we'll just have to wait and see how this is uh, going to play out. So, um, but it is interesting, and um, um, I'm certainly interested in waiting for the results. I did talk about the framework for the four phases that are coming out as to how a vaccine, when it does come out, how it's going to be distributed and implemented. You heard a lot of news about states being informed about being prepared uh, for a November 1st, be prepared by November 1st. Uh, to be able to um, um, to 
for distribution as well as the process for uh, vaccination immunizing um, individuals, uh, not only uh, locally, but also uh, state region. So this is a huge, massive endeavor uh, with a, a vaccine campaign um, that's never been done before, not to this scale worldwide. And so this is a pretty big deal. But again, phase one, phase two, high risk individuals, healthcare workers, first responders, that phase one B, high risk individuals. We went through uh, what, what's considered a chronic condition as being uh, one of those high risk people living in uh, nursing homes, long-term care facilities, assisted living areas. These are high risk elderly individuals. And then you can go down phase two, phase three, phase four, and then uh, obviously uh, to the general public. So there is a framework and they're gonna refine this, but um, uh, keep in mind, this is still if the vaccine uh, becomes uh, available. I know uh, Pfizer, um, you know, Pfizer uh, came out um, with an announcement that their data uh, that recently came out indicating the vaccine, their vaccine uh, is generally safe and well tolerated. And so they're looking to apply for authorization in mid-October, which is pretty soon, really only about four weeks away. If it does become approved, they will be the first one. Um, uh, and the United States has an agreement with Pfizer for the distribution uh, of 100 million doses uh, of, of their vaccine. So uh, this is going to be something that's going to be in the news. It's going to be coming fast and uh, quite possible uh, there may be a, a vaccine for uh, distribution. Now, Pfizer and Moderna, they have already developed, they've already started their developing of, of these um, um, these their vaccines that they're developing um, already. And so if they get authorization, they will certainly be um, the distribution of, of the, their new vaccine would be almost immediate. So they're just waiting for their data to be presented, to be authorized, and um, they're ready to go. So it's quite possible um, that this could occur before the, the year is out. Now, like I said, different format. So we're gonna do this a little different. So now we'll get into some numbers and uh, we'll get through this and we'll, we'll certainly talk about uh, any questions at the end. So, so worldwide, uh, 27,000, I'm sorry, 27,000, we wish, right? Uh, 27 million infections, 6.8% uh, increase, percent increase from the week prior. Trending wise, that is going down. Worldwide, this is going down. The fatalities of almost 900,000, 4.6% from the week prior, uh, again, but the trend is going down, as you can see, and has been going down for the last six weeks. In the United States, uh, more than 84 million tests have been conducted at this point. Uh, 6.4 million cases, 5.6% uh, increase from the week prior. And looking at trends and how this has been going over the last uh, probably eight, nine weeks, um, we've come from a high point in mid-July down to where we are now, uh, 5.6, 4.5. I think we're going to be running around this number uh, in the fives, low fives, high fours for a while. We'll just it's come down, but now we're just at this kind of plateau stage. Uh, almost 190,000 fatalities, 4.89% uh, increase. Again, uh, we've come from a high point and it has come down. And again, I suspect we will continue to um, be in this um, uh, um, plateau of, of fatalities. 
in Wisconsin, 83,334. That's an 8.0% increase from, from the week prior. Something that's a little unusual, uh, not unusual, but it, it just that what I'm seeing is we've come from a high point of, of mid-July. We plateau, we kind of started bottoming out, but now we're starting to see an upsurge uh, in cases. And that's concerning because that's even before we went into the Labor Day weekend. So I'll, I'll make comment in a few minutes about uh, the numbers, the trends I'm seeing here as well. 73,964 people have recovered, 1,183 fatalities, 3.5% increase, uh, at least here in the state of Wisconsin, that trend seems to be going downwards. Um, obviously, this, this discussion is about natives, 573 federally recognized tribes in the country. We know that 70% uh, of, of the native population reside off the reservation. Uh, and the individuals that do um, maintain residence on a reservation, almost two, uh, almost half of the native population, uh, 2.6, actually utilize the Indian health system for their for all of their care. So, um, a lot of people uh, utilize our Indian health system, uh, and we're quite diverse, both federal, tribal, and urban programs throughout the country. So. Uh, it's important to to know that um, not all healthcare uh, resides on on the reservation. So let's get into some numbers. So <clears throat> this is a data set from the Indian Health Service. Um, their last numbers uh, provided was just a couple of days ago, September eighth. As you can see on the far left. Hand side, uh, September 8th is their profile. Uh, T negative is their total negative, T positive, the total positives up to date. As you go through each area, you see that there are some areas that are highlighted. These are the areas that I feel that are the most significant, uh, at least maintaining a high level or continue to or showing an increase in the number of cases. So as you go down, you can see Alaska and Oklahoma City are the two main areas that have the most significant numbers. Now, I think it's important to look at, when you look at this data set, is at the very bottom you see the, the number of cases from the past week. The total number of cases over the past seven days is 1,493. Now, that's pretty remarkable given what the trends have been in Indian country. So like September 1st, the total number of cases seven days prior was 2,039. So as you can see, as you can see, you go through the bottom list there. <clears throat> the last time we ever were at this point, I think was probably March, March April, April. We haven't seen numbers this low since April, which is pretty remarkable. My concern last week when I was talking to you was, you know, uh, it looked like we were going down and then we had an uptick uh, to 2000. I thought, is this a trend that was gonna go up? No, <clears throat> it actually went down. And, uh, you know, other areas uh, of native country, uh, Navajo, the Navajo area, we had um, there there only had 94 new cases over the last seven days. What's remarkable, um, I just read, was that the Navajo Nation on Monday only had one case, one new case on Monday, and had no cases on Tuesday, zero. It's been months. Months and months and months. This is the first time they've actually had no new cases of coronavirus on the Navajo Reservation, uh, dating back all the way down back to, to March. So, um, you know, there is light uh, at the end of the tunnel here. You know, obviously we heard about Navajo Nation. We heard about all the, the cases. And they were one of the first, uh, first tribes that had showcased such a high per capita rate to now 
no cases for the first time in months. So there's a tremendous re amount of relief that's going on in, in Navajo, I'm sure. So as we go to the far right, <clears throat> you can see all the months, uh, all the points uh, uh, of the months that I've provided, yellow being high marks. Um, and then we get into the percent change. Percent change on the average, 3.55% change overall. There are areas that certainly have a higher than the average, but again, these numbers are trending down, and which is which is really nice to see, and that's what we want to see, because um, it tells us that things are improving. I'm not saying put your guard down, but the trend, at least in this time, the trend is down, and this is going into this is. These are numbers based on going into the Labor Day weekend. I think in the next two weeks, we'll certainly know more as a result of the Labor Day weekend, what, if any, kind of impact it will have on native, uh, the Native communities, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see. The percent positive tests overall for, for IHS, 4.56%. That's pretty good. It's less than the 5% that's been touted as being that kind of threshold uh, of good or bad trends and you can see that there are even though the numbers in the areas may be low we still have a high percent positive so that's really kind of a two indications one uh, the tests that are being done there is a high success rate of actually capturing the positives which we want so it is good that we have a high well let me rephrase that it's not that it's good it's 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 assuring us that we are doing what we're intended to do by testing to and identifying positive cases. That way, identifying, isolating, quarantine, and conducting contact tracing to mitigate any further spread. So having uh, a high positive isn't necessarily a bad thing. It can be and work in your favor telling you that you are doing uh, what you're supposed to do in capturing these cases. Now, on the very far right, we see the trend, like I mentioned, there's really um, um, uh, two areas. Alaska is the only area that's actually continuing to go up. The other area is Oklahoma City, slightly down, but again, I highlighted them because they're such, at a, such a high rate of infection. Otherwise, if you look at every other area, it's either down or flat, which is remarkable, and overall, the trend for Indian country this week is going down. <clears throat> this is a kind of a quick snapshot into breaking out what's going on within each area. I pick Bemidji, Great Plains, and Billings. And that's on that top row on the bottom segment is all of the states that make up those, uh, the Bemidji area, Great Plains and Billings. And what I do is I look at the state's health department websites and I identify under the demographic portion, the number of native cases that have been reported. So I do this for each state. Um, so in Wisconsin, if we look at each state in, in that column, Wisconsin has the highest number of reported confirmed cases of coronavirus in the native population for more than Michigan, Minnesota, and uh, certainly Illinois. So it's, it's, it's com not comparing, it's utilizing the Indian health system and the public health departments of the states to really really identify natives that are outside of the system, into, inside the system of IHS, um, realizing that there are just as many cases outside of the reservation, outside of the Indian health system, um, that individual, individuals are being identified. So it's important to not rely on one data source. Uh, if you really wanna get a better picture of what's going on, it's better to utilize both the uh, both systems to get a better picture of what's going on. 
<clears throat> so looking at regionally what's going on uh, I know that's a lot of numbers however the first the first number set on each row is the most important that's the most up-to-date in Wisconsin 83,334 um, that's 62 a little over 60 6200 new cases over the past week 886 per day and you can see looking at that row you can see that the trend has been going up eight percent increase from the week prior again just another indi indicator that the trend is going up in michigan the trend has been hmm, relatively flat not significantly changed um, but they continue to have um, cases um, with only a 4.7% increase from the week prior. So they've remained relatively flat in, in, in their trend. Indiana, uh, at least at uh, this past two weeks, their trend has been downwards. In Illinois, 253,000 cases. Um, their um, 15,000, they're having 15,000 cases over the past week, over 2,100 cases per day. Um, their trending is slightly going up, which is um, concerning. Um, the reason why I say that is that we're just starting to get into the flu, cold and flu season, with a concerning increase in number uh, of COVID cases. Uh, there's going to be some confusion and potential for another virus to be introduced into the into the community um very concerning um, um with with that coming up with the flu cold and flu season coming up to have an upsurge in covid um is is uh worrisome minnesota their trend is is uh is down uh, 6.2 percent increase from the week prior. 40, almost 4,800 new cases from from the week in, uh, in the past week. Uh, that's averaging out to 683 cases per day. So, for them in Minnesota, uh, the trend is down. So we have Wisconsin, uh, Illinois as upward trends. Michigan, Indiana, kind of flat, and Minnesota uh, on a downward trend. So hopefully uh, uh, Wisconsin and Illinois, we can kind of right the ship here and get things uh, better in, in the next several weeks, especially with uh, cold and flu season coming up. <clears throat> Looking at the tribes <clears throat> over the state of Michigan, the 12 tribes, we have their respective counties. That first number is the total number of active, uh, total overall total cases in parentheses is the number of new cases over the past week. Um, as you go down the list, you can see I have a few U's. Uh, however, putting that uh, in the perspective like uh, um, Kawina and Barga, Baraga County, they over, overall they have 11 cases. They've only had three new cases in the past week. That's an up given that at least what the activity has been for them. So three cases is actually a lot for them. So that's an upward trend. Uh, Little River, Ottawa, 11 cases. That's certainly a lot more than their normal number. So that's an upward, um, an upward swing. In Cass County, the the number actually had been fairly low, um, low teens, and in the past week has actually gone up. But for the most part, overall, the entire state, every county that uh, a tribe um, resides in, has been trending downwards. <clears throat> so that's a good thing. The overall total number of cases in Michigan, uh, 484. That's only 19 new cases identified in the past week, 4.1% increase overall. You can see that is trending downwards and has been trending downwards <clears throat> for the last six, six weeks. So in the state of Michigan, 
um, in terms of uh, number of, of native cases uh, actually has done quite quite well and trending has been going down and down and so you know Michigan certainly is doing quite well uh, in, in mitigating the the spread of, of coronavirus there in the state of Minnesota <clears throat> The 11 tribes of Minnesota with their respective counties. Again, the first number is the overall number of cases in parentheses is the number of new cases. And as you go down, you can see that there are um, uh, downward trends uh, that are going on. You know, counties like Carleton, St. Louis, where Fond du Lac um, um, resides in, you have this overlap of both native non-native communities involved and so um, 167 cases for the for these two counties that's an upward swing but all upwards don't necessarily mean tribally uh, affiliated so um, i will say when we get down to the upper sioux the yellow medicine county we see a uh, uh, an upward trend and this has been ongoing for the last three weeks I put an asterisk there just indicating uh, there's been a trend more than a week um, 50 new cases and that's pretty remarkable given that that almost essentially doubled their number of cases in in one week so uh, quite quite concerning um, Millac uh, and counties of Pine uh, Atkin and Crow Wing counties the number of new cases in the past week is 73 and that's certainly significant but when we start looking at the overall numbers of reported cases to the state to the state health department uh, 655 that's only 29 new cases only 29 new cases in in, in minnesota uh, that's actually pretty that's fairly low uh, not the lowest number they've had in a week but pretty significant for the state of Minnesota and they are trending downwards. <clears throat> now, as we move to the state of Wisconsin, much different picture in the state of Wisconsin. Now, when I showed the IHS data, when I showed the IHS data, uh, Bemidji overall only had 64, only 64 new cases. Now, What's significant about that, 64 new cases, so that includes Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Of those three states, the Indian health system is only reporting 64 new cases. Well, when we look at the state Wisconsin Health Department's data on natives, uh, native cases, we get a much bit different picture. Now, I've gone through each county and again, the first number is the overall number in parentheses is the number of new cases in the past week. So we have upward trends in Shawano, uh, upward trends in Otagami, Brown County, Forest County, uh, Vilas, Sauk County, Jackson, Bayfield, Barron, Burnett, Polk, Washburn. So if you look at this, this is really a more rural, a more rural um upswing in cases now the general thinking has always been well this is maybe more of a big city or bigger population issue and i would say for the most part that is and has been the case where most of the cases have been more urban based more city based but we have all of this movement of people all over the state northern part summertime last weekend getaways you know people are still moving and still interacting still engaging but now we're starting to see more and more cases start popping up in the world and this is what exactly what we're seeing at least what i'm seeing and, and observing in the state of wisconsin we have where the majority of the counties are showing upward swings and it there's no you know really no area in northern uh, wisconsin that has not been affected and so when i look at the overall number of native cases in the states we are now 
higher than Michigan, we're higher than Illinois, we're higher than uh, Minnesota, and <clears throat> with 862 cases, that's 82, 82 new cases. Now, 82, it may not seem all that significant. Well, it is when that is the highest number of new cases in Wisconsin in one week period than I've seen since, since I've been observing all the numbers, 82, that's, that's a lot, 10.5% increase. So just looking at the trends, this has been not just a, a, you know, a one week, one, one week up, one week down, this is consistently, we're seeing higher and higher numbers over the past month. And that's concerning. Um, it's concerning because I see trends in the rural area going up and now we're seeing overall more cases. So the point being is IHS 64 cases and that includes three states in Wisconsin alone, we have 82. So what I'm saying is the cases that are popping up are outside, <clears throat> um, are not just within the Indian health system, but outside of the Indian health system. And that's concerning because um, it's, you know, there's, there's no, no places that people can, can, can hide from this. It's, it's everywhere. Illinois, 329 cases. That's 10 new cases from the week prior. One good thing about Illinois is they're, they're when they start showing demographics by age group, they also show the number of cases by age group. And you can see that top number, that top number indicates the number of native cases by age group. So they actually do a good job in, in displaying that, not only the demographics, but the age uh, of their demographics, which is really nice. Illinois, 67 is the highest number of cases in that, that occur in the younger, in the younger population. So <clears throat> uh, just a nice way to be able to showcase that information. As I mentioned, in the state of Wisconsin, 862, there's been one new fatality in the past week. Uh, that's four, four new cases in the past four weeks. And um, as I mentioned, the trend of cases is going up as you and so just uh, concerning in, for the state of Wisconsin, uh, not just um, in the urban cities, but also in the rural community uh, communities as well. When we start looking at age group uh, distribution of cases. The one, the one thing that has occurred is that we know that the 20 year olds make up the majority of cases and, and that hasn't changed. But what has changed now in the past week is, is we're seeing higher rates in the 10 to 19 year olds. And so now we have a shift, a, a shift in the case distribution and it is now, it may start shifting more to the younger, younger, younger population. I've talked about 20 year olds, but now what we need to start talking about is the 10 to 19 year olds. The week prior, they were 10% of all cases. Now they're up, now they took a bump and now they're 11%. So it's a bit concerning um, because on the other side, the 30 year olds have decreased. So this is a good indication that things are shifting, uh, shifting again. And uh, I'll certainly keep people up to date and what that looks like if this continues to be the case. Um, Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, Indiana, South Dakota, uh, New Mexico, Montana, Idaho, all with that younger age group distribution. It's not unique um, to Wisconsin. Uh, it is everywhere. And um, certainly with the back to school, we have our younger population in our high school, uh, K through 12 going back to school. Um, we've heard, you know, places where cases have increased and spiked. Uh, we, we may see another shift uh, occurring here in, in, in due time. So but we'll see, we'll see how this goes. 
As I mentioned, the seven-day average <clears throat> in the state of Wisconsin, 886. So really interesting. We're almost back to our July 25th. Um, for our uh, July 25th uh, peak. That was our kind of new record peak, seven day peak at that time. Um, and that was, what was that? That was what, eight, like 890, 895, something like that as a high mark. Now, what was interesting as we went into this weekend, we thought, oh, Labor Day, we we'll see all kinds of new cases coming out of Labor Day. Well, guess what? It hit before Labor Day weekend. We had uh, over 1,400 new cases um, on Friday. And that or was that Thursday. I think it was Thursday, Friday, something like that. Where we went into the weekend with this new record number of cases. And throughout the weekend, 800, 900. And it's like, oh my gosh, we, we, you know, I thought this was supposed to happen after Labor Day. No. Nope. It happened going into Labor Day. So now we have these <clears throat> this sudden uh, jump uh, in new cases. And right before I came on this segment, um, the two the new case total for today um, was over 1,500, which is a new state record for the number of new cases. So we haven't even been, you know, a full week into coming out of the Labor Day and we already have a new spike in, in record number of cases uh, for the state of Wisconsin. Now, what's interesting is that I don't believe, I don't believe you can blame it on the cities, the major metro areas, uh, or let me rephrase that. Don't blame it on Milwaukee even though it's the highest populated area, don't blame it on Milwaukee for the increase in the number of cases because it's not there. <clears throat> Milwaukee County certainly has a high total number of new cases, but over the past week, um, there's only been 700 new cases in Milwaukee County. <clears throat> and that's only a 2.9% increase from the week prior. So where are all these cases coming from? Well, they're coming from other places other than Milwaukee. Uh, we're talking the greater Milwaukee area, talking about Hatagami, Brown County, and Dane County as being the drivers <clears throat> for this kind of resurgence of numbers in the state of Wisconsin. 400 and, uh, 414 fatalities in the state of Wisconsin. That's only five, five new fatalities over the past week in Milwaukee County. So when we look at this center graph, we can see where all the new cases are coming from. Smaller the circle, and this really is in indicative of kind of the trend activity that's going on is really low. It's really low in Milwaukee County. The only real concentrated area is south of the highway. And I'll talk a little bit more about where in those, uh, where in those areas these cases are showing. But when we start looking at this left lower hand corner, the, the bar graph there, as I said, all the new resurgence of cases is not coming from Milwaukee. because you can just see the trend. The trend is going down and it has been going down um, you know, like July 4th weekend, the trend is just going down, down, down. It's, and it's not for a lack of testing. We, we do probably the most testing uh, in the state in, in Milwaukee than anywhere else, but we're just not seeing the cases. The, uh, the cases are not here. Uh, they're coming from somewhere else. So this is a kind of a blow up of that, uh, those cases in Milwaukee County. So we see this high water mark, the first one in May 18th, we had 354 cases. In July 8th, we had 370 as being a high mark. Just a couple of days ago, we only had 37. 37 cases. That's, you know, I mean, it's significant, but comparis comparatively to the population of Milwaukee County, 
it's almost nothing. Um, there's probably more people diagnosed with high blood pressure than there are COVID-19, if you believe that. I do. 37 cases on September 5th. Uh, that's, that's really low. It is really low. Now, when we start looking at the percent positive rate in Milwaukee County and the city of Milwaukee, again, the trend is going down. The seven day average as of September 7th is 5%. Last week it was 6%. Today, or I should say, not today, but as of um, September 7th, it's 5%. What's even more remarkable is when we look at the city of Milwaukee, Milwaukee City, the percent positive. Last week it was 4.88%, or wait, 4.38%. As of September 8th, 0.93%. 0.93%. Not that we're not testing. We are. The cases are just not popping up. They're, they're just not there. Now, when we start looking at trends, you know, what are we seeing in the city of Milwaukee? September 8th, seven-day average, 28 cases. And you can just see as of like July, the week after July 4th weekend, looks like a ski slope just going down, sliding down. The numbers are just not there. The number is going down. And when we look at <clears throat> activity of cases, we see that the zip codes in <clears throat> of 53204 or 53215, the most, the highest concentration of, of cases in Milwaukee are in these two zip codes. Hola, I'm back. I'm sorry. Glick, the Gerald L. Ignace Indian Health Center, resides in zip code um, 53204. Uh, we've been doing testing. You know, we've had cases, um, but they're, they're not a lot. It's not a lot. But in our own backyard is where the predominance of, of cases that, that show up. And so just trying to give you a good sense of where all of uh, these cases are occurring. <clears throat> Overall in Milwaukee, uh, the number of native cases in Milwaukee is 109, um, which has been pretty stable. Uh, slow incremental increases, uh, seven new cases from the week prior. Um, so I know we're kind of short on time a little bit, um, so I want to maybe cut this short a little bit to be able to answer some questions. Uh, so Mark and Jeremiah, I know I talked a lot. I gave some pretty high level stuff discussion. Everyone put on their thinking cap. Going back to school on all your biochemistry. So, so Mark, if, uh, if, you, if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to discuss. Hey, Dr. Ignace, uh, do you get a question that came in? Jeremiah, I saw this one came in from you, kind of interesting, meaning that in Milwaukee, kind of for the instructional staff, you know, our official start date was mm -hmm. August 24th, meeting with students, advising, the orientation kind of thing. And then uh, August, I'm sorry, September 2nd was first mm -hmm. day of school. Uh, this dovetails into Jeremiah's question, meaning the incubation rate for COVID-19 is what is that? Five to uh, five days to two weeks for sure. Um, what kind of concerns do you have around that, or anything to help out parents that may need to to have students at some universities? We've seen students headed back. Some universities keeping their students in. Uh, but let's say a student out there, let's make it concrete. Student has choices. I can attend classes or not attend classes. 
what would you tell that student at UW Milwaukee, Marquette University, Carroll College, uh, all the other folks that are out there helping our students out? What would you let them know if that instructor is giving them their, hey, you got a choice here, you can attend in person or online. What's your advice? Um, in person, I think it's a personal choice. Um, now for me, I, I like, I'm a bit old school. I like paper and pencil. Uh, I, I like sitting in the in the in the te in the chairs in front of your professor in, in classes. So uh, I may have a different perspective just because I'm older. But you know, you know, if there's an option, I, I think it really depends on comfort level for each individual. Um, there may be individuals that are indifferent about it, and they, you know maybe indifferent about the virus or maybe indifferent about whether learning online or in person. Um, I, I do know that individuals that do have underlying health conditions should go online without question. Uh, I, I don't think they should try to brave the elements here to just uh, attend a class, but if there's you know, true uh, underlying conditions, they should probably, I would advise them to um, stay online. Um, you know, the other thing, too, is we do know that the younger generation, while they, they, do, they, they do get the, the virus, uh, tend to have more of a mild, um, mild symptoms, and their recovery uh, seems to be a little quicker than the, the older generations with, with uh, fewer and rarer events of poor outcomes. And so, um, you know, I can see a 20 year old at college being independent for two years, uh, may be completely indifferent to what's going on and do whatever they want. Um, we were all there at one point and um, uh, they may feel like uh, a bit invincible and even if they do get it, nothing bad's gonna happen to them other than a cough and a runny nose. So a question from a mom here. Again, some of this stuff comes on my phone. Uh, can a person have two viruses at once? Can they have COVID-19? Can they have something else? And, and kind of what's your advice around that? Yeah, that, absolutely they could. Um, they could have, you know, and, and that's the, that's the, that's going to be kind of the wicked thing coming up in the cold and flu season is that someone may come up with a cold, a common cold that's not COVID, and then two weeks later pop up with COVID. And so they could be kind of in this prolonged illness stage for a, an entire month. Um, you know, there's no, there's no reason why you couldn't have COVID-19 and the flu at the same time. Uh, that would be really bad um, um, and pretty miserable for the individual. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely, uh, absolutely possible that people can have concurrent uh, viruses or even virus and a bacteria at the same time. I know I asked you this last week. Um, so this is a follow-up on that one. And this is uh, and a reminder, I, I would imagine, out there. And that's about face masks. Mm -hmm. We're seeing face shields become more available commercially. Uh, even eBay, uh, Marketplace, all these different places where just the uh, average people can get them, make them. And we're starting to see them, meaning at larger, larger stores. Uh, people are wearing them both behind the counter and walking into the store. Uh, so, so as a doctor, when you're seeing people defining that as a face mask, both professionally in their places of business for their workers, uh, what would you say to the folks going into those businesses and seeing that kind of thing or thinking, hey, if they're doing it, I can do it. What, what's, your, what's your position on those uh, see-through face mask and that's all they're wearing so it's kind of funny so if you ask me what my expression would be my jaw would hit the ground um because you know i kind of look at him sideways because it we we know that it's in the air um face shields only protect a you know a gross display being projected on you uh, but if it's aerosolized, it can go around the face shield. And so it really isn't going to be protective. You might as well not wear anything, uh, to tell you the truth. 
Um, now, if they wore a face mask and a face shield, you know, they may be like a one or two percent more protected than someone who's just wearing a face mask alone. So, but the face shield alone, I, I've seen that in grocery stores and I, 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 I kind of cringe a little bit because, but every time I go to the grocery store, they're always there wearing the same thing. So, I don't know. I mean, they're not sick. Well, not right at the moment. <laughs> well, they're, not, they keep, they're there as, as often as I am. And so I was like, man, does that really work or not? I don't know. I, I, no, I'm not going to say that. It doesn't work. So, <clears throat> All right. I just want to be sure about that because we're seeing it more and more. Uh, and there's more availability. So last question on this one. We're moving into a fall season where in Milwaukee, Oktoberfest is a real big thing. Uh, Halloween haunted houses. Uh, young people are going to want to go to that, and that certainly is within that kind of 10 to, to 19 area where folks are wanting to go and, and do that kind of thing. So, and, and someone say, well, you know, I'm going to go to a haunted house, and, and they got it outside. Mm -hmm. There are going to be people grabbing at them, yelling in their face, all that kind of stuff. I, I just, you know, if you could just kind of gather up your, your doctor and your dad advice voice for this one. Uh, so parents can help talk to their kids and saying, hey, look, you want to go to a haunted house? Yeah. This is what you're looking at, and, and this is what we need to do as a family. So, you know, the fact that um, any activity or event outdoors um, is better, bar none. It's just a better environment. Um, now, hay rides, outdoor activities, uh, trick or treating, um, haunted house visits outside. You know, I, I think if you were to go and the family wore a mask outdoors for a haunted house outing, um, I would say that would probably be okay. That would be okay. I'd be, I would be okay with that. Pumpkin rides, you know, on the on the on the buggies, and you know, if you're just you and your family, I'd probably say no big deal. If you're with a bigger group on on a hayride, I'd probably wear a mask, but I wouldn't. I, I would still feel comfortable being outdoors, um, even in a group setting like that. I would be fine going out in the pumpkin patch, looking. You know, I um, I would find that to be pretty comfortable as well. I think most activities outdoors, I would feel pretty comfortable, except when you go into these mass moving kind of things, I would, I would be more hesitant. But um, even if you went through a haunted house outdoors, I'd wear a mask, I'd be fine, I'd be fine with that. Uh, so I'm sure that's including just a reminder when you're taking kids to stores that they're not putting masks on that they see on the racks either because there might be a young person or somebody else that tried it on about 15 minutes before and you'll never know. Uh, <laughs> so let's, uh, let's do this. We're a few minutes uh, uh, behind our schedule and, and closing things out as we usually do. Uh, we're gonna go to you, Dr. Ignace, to close our program out and it should be an interesting one next week. Yeah, we will be We will be fully onto our, our uh, week and a half to two weeks into regular schooling. And certainly the UWs will be having some uh, announcements coming out. So Dr. Ignace, we're gonna turn these last comments over to you and close out our program. Dr. Ignace. Thanks. And, and so just as, as Mark was saying, the dynamics, they shift almost hourly to day to day. You know, it is, it is hopeful. The stuff that I see and read and, and research, I'm, I'm hopeful. And I'm encouraged every time I read something new. And I'm encouraged with the information that's coming out regarding the, the vaccine. And so <clears throat> that's actually a good thing. Uh, I do, you know, with AstraZeneca and its adverse uh, uh, event that occurred, you know, it's going to be hard to know whether or not it's directly related. It's certainly possible, although, you know, uh, it will set them back because uh, they they were kind of in that forefront. Now they're kind of back in the middle of the pack. So, um, but, you know, overall, you know, 
Indian country, the numbers are overall trending downwards. Um, you know, Minnesota, Michigan trending downwards. Wisconsin, not so much. We got to do a better job here in Wisconsin. Um, but I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged to know that places like Navajo Nation have gone down to zero new cases in a day, which, which I'm sure most people thought was, wouldn't be possible, but it is. And so it's encouraging. I'm encouraged uh, to see progress uh, being made uh, on the scientific front, vaccine, therapeutics, um, the stories of, of uh, 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 tribes and, and areas, uh, numbers are decreasing, um, which is great. We want to see that. It means that everyone is still maintaining their vigilance and their, um, their prevention as best they possibly can. So um, stay, everyone needs to stay uh, super vigilant and, and continue to be active in supporting your community and, and prevention as much as possible. So uh, more information next week, uh, more updates, more numbers. Uh, until then, um, stay strong and stay safe.